So the first session on the SDGs was talking about, uh, and I'm going back on the slide, it's talking about financial inclusion. And financial inclusion, the discussion uh, was about no poverty, SDG number one, zero hunger, number two, and good health and well-being. And Beatrice, if you let me hold this, then you can talk about this. I love men doing this instead of women like... Yeah, huh? take the microphone. Okay, um, where is my group? Where are you? Ah, you need to do like this, so I know that I'm in the right way, okay? Um, so first, we were very happy because to, to, for us, uh, financial inclusion is really connected with no poverty, no hunger, and good, good health, because uh, financial stress is one of the main causes of, of bad health, you know, in the world. So we were happy because said, oh, we have the easiest, um, you know, um, task. We didn't need to jump from, from, from one to another. And also, so when we thought about what the financial industry could do, and we agree with three actions, three real actions. First, I think we think that financial industry should do responsible microcredit um, business plus financial education. Responsible, do give the credit to those who you know that is going to pay back. Okay, this is not about donations. And also, also financial education needs to be included in the money. No financial education, no money. Just to be clear. <laughs> okay. The second, do responsible banking. If you don't want people to get into poverty, if you need them to, to get a good health, and you need, do you want them not to be worried about their, their financial, do offer the right advice and the right products Okay, and offer your employees with the right commercial incentives. Banks are men and computers. That's it. So, if they do they give them the right products, we solve these three things. And finally, okay, the poverty is the CEO of, of my Spanish market, so you're his to me. Can just math pay. Okay. And the third thing is why don't you allocate a percentage of your profit before tax to do social investment focused precisely in these three things? To finish the hunger, the poverty, and good health by 2030, 2030 on these specific locations. To make it as specific as you can. Be accountable for it and give reasons in uh, why, uh, what you have done with this money. That's the three things that we can do, we think that the financial industry could do. So is that, feasible for the is that feasible for the sector? Absolutely. If not, you know, I will be, I'm volunteered to be CEO of any bank of you <laughs> to make it possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> then the second group was about uh, quality education, naturally, of course, finance, finance should be part of that, and gender equality, and that was led by Giovanna Paradino. Ah, and Sergio, Sergio Manea will be the speaker. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll just do what that we said. I'll be the man keeping the, uh, the point. Uh, so, uh, Giovanna, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not a pure event that actually it's a man presenting the gender uh, uh, opportunities uh, or equal gender opportunities. Well, we looked at it and we said, okay, what is it that we want to touch? So definitely everything what we discussed is about creating opportunities and creating awareness uh, starting from the young generation of ladies that pretty much they can do everything they would like to. So there is a journey. And the journey starts with creating um, uh, alternative curricula, actually, in schools where we can talk about the opportunities in business, the opportunities in life, and we would like that to be role modeled um, by ladies who are successful in everything uh, what they do. So we will try to move uh, the icon um, on the ladies' front for the young ladies and for the young girls in the area of, yes, she can be my model. So in other words, to quote from someone a little bit earlier, it's about creating a, a, an alternative curricula sustained by the role models in order that every and each of the girls can imagine in building her own cathedral. So that's the point number one. Um, Point number two, it actually reflects to the lifelong learning. 
we do have uh, significant uh, participation in front office or in back office, uh, rather repetitive op operations of, of, of ladies. So it's all about reskill and upskill uh, of, of, of the ladies. So this is a private sector. Uh, thing and I think we in financial services we should do it especially as we talk about digitization robotization of, of certain activities so we believe it's about investing uh, quite a lot in the direction of the rescue and, and, and upskill then last uh, two things um, yes we need also part of the creating opportunities, we need to actually make sure that we are opening up opportunities for, for, for ladies starting again from school in terms of risk adversity. So, and risk adversity manifests, as we, as we learned today, across the board. It's not only about, uh, I'm afraid of failure, I'm not going to apply to this school or that school, but it also reflects in the way uh, ladies, um, or yes, are looking at, uh, women are looking at the wealth creation. First of all, they have a protective instinct. Therefore, most of the way they deploy their capital or available uh, cash will be actually in savings, savings products. So we have to deal via quality education, as I said, part of this alternative curricula which should go through the life, lifetime into the risk, uh, risk adversity, while it's nurturing the exceptional capabilities, for example, in managing human capital. And that brings the... Um, uh, the, the point to the fourth level is we do see that the participation of women in actually C rooms and S rooms is still, uh, is still too limited. So we as financial services could sponsor research and data gathering which can show actually the fact that companies which have in the leadership teams, formal or informal, as I said, in C rooms and S rooms, they have uh, ladies represented uh, in decision-making positions for those companies. And we could show, as, as we learned, uh, as it was presented in Belgium, for example, over the weekend, that the stock market companies which have uh, ladies in the, in the boardrooms or in the CEO position, in fact, are performing better than the ones which are not pursuing uh, gender diversity. And we would like to actually uh, contribute in creating this data and this content in order to lead to a better representation of women uh, in the, in the decision-making and in the management uh, positions. So this is the journey, and I think we can start this journey uh, step by step. Thank you. Thank you very much, and clearly uh, a long journey ahead of us. And we'd be happy to make that part of the report uh, later on. Group number three, on the climate action and uh, clean energy, and I'll serve as your postal holder. Thank you. You're actually doing a great job there. Um, well, yeah, we were talking about clean energy, climate change. And um, first of all, we discovered that actually it is financial education and, for example, looking at the topic of clean energy and, and climate change, what we need are really sustainable life skills. That's what we need to teach. And that's what we're doing all the time in our jobs. And that's what others are doing in their jobs. And we need to combine all this. And we thought that it's best done by uh, really using good working public-private partnerships. Because, I mean, there you have everything, everybody in one, one working group, more or less. Then it is very important to evaluate um, the green literacy. We, we've been talking about uh, evaluating financial literacy. And I guess, I guess, I'm not an expert there, that green literacy has been evaluated already as well. But um, we were not aware of the fact, but unless you know what the level of green literacy in all the countries are, um, you can't really act on it. And then thirdly is um, create incentives, because only if you give them, if, if you give people incentives, are they willing to change their behavior? Because acting in a green way is usually, or nowadays still, more, more expensive. And that's where the incentives come in. You have to show them that it's a good idea 
to invest in green funds, for example, or buy green products. Um, and obviously, legislation is very important as well, because if, if you can do anything you want, you always go um, the easiest way. And that's it. Thank you very much. Then Philip with uh, Group 4 on innovation and infrastructure. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, the first point is a relatively easy point. I mean, financial education makes it simply easier for you to find support, especially uh, uh, in regards to access to financial investments, which are, of course, needed um, to, so to say, to, to get to a proper infrastructure. And it also helps you to become uh, a more innovative uh, entrepreneur. Um, and uh, that's why you also should start as soon as possible already in schools with entrepreneurship trainings and financial education trainings. The second point, um, Sergio will laugh very much because it didn't come from me, it came from a central banker and uh, he mentioned that financial education can and should be provided by the private sector and by banks. Uh, otherwise, if not, you would eliminate um, one tier of, um, so to say, of, of institutions that can provide um, financial education. Uh, we heard it before uh, that financial education alone is not enough. You need a whole set of life skills. Uh, Nina uh, was just mentioning it. In, in, in our case, regarding innovation, regarding infrastructure, uh, financial education has to be accompanied by digital literacy uh, to understand uh, simply the infrastructure needs. And um, also a very simple thing is that being literal, literate simply helps you to negotiate better conditions for your loans uh, that, that you need for investments. Um, and uh, there are even some banks uh, in the States which if you prove that you're literate, uh, they give you a better risk assessment. So uh, you get your loan cheaper. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Then group number five. Andrea. Come here, I'll help you. So we thought, in addition to goal number eight, which is a decent work in economic growth, we are also assigned to responsible consumption. So some of this will be repetitive, but at least it will reinforce the conclusions of others. So the first thing we talked about was that economic growth and sustainability really should go together. And we're talking now about the role of financial education. So financial education can promote an understanding of the circular or sustainable economy. Um, and how do they do that and who does it? We spend a lot of time figuring out who the educators are. So if you're talking about financial products and sustainability, Obviously, you can inform investors of the environmental impact of the products they're buying or the companies that they're investing in. Um, and we're talking about not just consumers, but also institutions. A lot of this is already happening. The cliche, the social impact investing, green investing. Um, I guess we're just saying there can still be more of that and, and really understanding the, the, that Prosperity doesn't just mean economic return, but it means that when economic return and a healthy world are combined, that that might be prosperity. So that, that's just educating people from children on up. So that was one thing, the linking of the two and the redefining about what prosperity actually is. And again, the teachers of this message run the gamut. Families, schools, financial institutions, policymakers, et cetera. The next thing we shifted to um, was really what can financial education do to promote entrepreneurship and the growth of small and medium-sized companies. So on the entrepreneurship front, 
uh, we acknowledge that education around funding options um, already occurs in banks. Um, but we were questioning, you know, is that sufficient? And where, again, can financial education kick in to help ec economies grow, at least in these sectors, entrepreneurship and small and medium? So we discussed the fact that um, beyond banks, um, you know, the governments can have a role in providing information. And um, obviously, we have private incubators and accelerators. There was some concern that those might have sort of an economic bias. They're not going to accelerate you unless you can turn a profit. So who else can be out there as a source of information just on, again, funding options that's dispassionate? Um, banks, there are some banks that are providing information just sort of uh, generically as opposed to being linked to a product. Um, and I think, was this the example? Um, well, and the question was, who, who else um, should be out there educating entrepreneurs as to how they could finance themselves? Um, in the small and medium-sized companies, the same themes came up. Again, the concept of public and private partnerships providing information. And I believe we had in our group, we had individuals from the Czech Republic and said that there is already an example. There's something called Czech Invest, which is a public um, source of information for uh, growth companies where they can find out more than just a bank can finance them. How else could they do that? Um, and the last thing we got around to was just talking about teaching entrepreneurship. So we talk about financial literacy and we talk about schools. We often think about, okay, can you compound? Do you know what a checking account, et cetera, is? But we thought that entrepreneurship is a lot more than just that. It isn't just about, it's a mindset or how do you think as a high schooler, you know, what someone could stimulate you thinking, oh, if you were going to start a company tomorrow, what would you have to think about? So we thought about the idea of expanding what teaching financial literacy means to giving younger people a sense of entrepreneurship as well. That was as far as we got. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad to hear that entrepreneurship is a natural part of the work that we do in financial education. Then the final one, partnerships for the goals. Number 17, that's the final, and that's one of the favorite ones for EBF. I know Wim is very enthusiastic about this one. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Raymond. Um, the rest of the group is here near me, so I'm happy to represent our group that was dealing with this interesting subject of partnerships for the goals, which we immediately found the cross-cutting issue, not only among all the goals previously mentioned, because all speakers now were mentioning the needed cooperation and other stakeholders. But we also found it as an interesting uh, game of words. Partnerships, financial education goals, they're impacting each other. So we immediately all agree that partnerships are must, basically, today. Also both in goals, but also in financial education. So without partnerships, hardly we could do nationally or uh, globally something visible and useful. Uh, the, the diversity of stakeholders we also immediately identified. We talk about public, private, and neutral roles in this ecosystem. And uh, they all are correlated, and they are very nationally um, different, how to say. So depending on the national culture and the experience, we are facing very different uh, types of uh, linkages between these different stakeholders. Uh, why they were for us number one factor that we can only influence, we are actually one of them, whether we are coming from the Association of Banks or other institutions, uh, because we are all relevant, we are impacting some national policies, some national goals while doing this education. Uh, that's why we put um, uh, this as a must because we want to avoid something that is very present in many of our countries, which is like a voluntarism. So our first strong recommendation would be that some guidelines are necessary of this partnership. We can talk about the national strategy for financial education. Lucky countries who have them because they have a lot of uh, other things uh, coordinated. 
or other declaration or guidelines, but we meant on a national framework, whatever declaration we may have. It would help much better partnerships to be productive after. Uh, then we also pointed out clear commitment, commitments and joint understanding. We all understand that uh, we are happy and enthusiastic to do many things, but once the people move from their office or ministry, the project may stop. In order to avoid that, we really recommend as a financial industry that clear commitments and joint understanding, again, through declaration or memorandum of understanding would be easy and, and a way to, to manage it. We can apply it on a project level scale, so we cooperate with someone just on that project, or we can propose institutional cooperation. But this is very needed, definitely. And talking about partnership, we also were not able to avoid the issue of funding. Why? Because the practice of funding show us that it can be mistaken sometimes. For example, the banks who are doing great efforts, they have natural need to have some brand around, which for us as association of banks and others is not allowed, and central banks. So this is really the, the big uh, the part of the, the real practice, and that's why we were not able to avoid funding. And when we say funding, we mean funding as an investment in the change of people's attitude in the future. So funding means not just gifts, but through that, we invest in the changes of people's perception of us and the banks and our real partnership that we have. Why? Because um, there is still a lot of prejudice and misinterpretations of all the actions we do. So this is just for us additional motivation that we need to go ahead with this, regardless the, the, the limitations maybe in the budget, but we see the, the, the real uh, contribution in this aspect. And just to conclude, we feel this not only as a must to regulate partnership and to put them, let's say, official, but uh, we are actually in a need to hurry up because we have this, some of these problems in the regular financial literacy. But new topics are coming that are very close to financial literacy, like the one we are elaborating today, which is SDGs, uh, which is uh, ECG principles, and also impact investing, which still is the term under construction, the definition. So we are aware also on the need to be quite fast in this uh, formalization of our partnerships. Let's simplify, but maybe it's not the, the best word. We thank you for your attention, and we are still open for your contribution for our wonderful brainstorming we had. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Slajana. Now, you, you may wonder what we're going to do with this. The, I, the plan is actually to create a little document based on the outcome of this uh, meeting, and the, uh, the recommendations on the SDG will play a central role. It's a source of inspiration, I think. I mean, we have our collective brain power basically put to work over here. Um, and that will also tie in to a discussion that is coming up on something called the banking principles, which will be introduced by the United Nations Environment Programme, the Finance Initiative on Sustainable Finance. That will happen before Christmas of this year.